John chapter 13, beginning with verse 34 and looking also at verse 35. The title of my address is, How the World Will Know We Belong to Jesus. Beautifully exemplified in the life and martyrdom of missionary Eleanor Chestnut. And hear the word of the Lord. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Jesus gave us what we call the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. He also gave us what we call the Great Commandments in Matthew chapter 22, verses 37 through 40. And interestingly, I had not seen this before, but both are captured quite well. In John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, in words that our Lord spoke on the night that he would be betrayed at the Last Supper. But both are also captured quite beautifully in the life of one of his superlative servants, a medical missionary by the name of Eleanor Chestnut, a woman whose love for Christ and others would be witnessed and sealed by her blood. Two observations I want to make from this text of Scripture this morning, one from verse 34, the other from verse 35. First, we must love others like Jesus has loved us. The word love appears only 12 times in John 1 through 12, but it appears 44 times in John 13 through 21. Jesus, as we just read, calls it a new commandment because it is new in him. We, we see love in him unlike we've ever seen love before. And it is also a new love because it is new in the messianic community that we call the church that he is forming. Don Carson, that wonderful New Testament scholar at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, says this, the new commandment is simple enough for a toddler to memorize and appreciate profound enough that the most mature believers are repeatedly embarrassed at how poorly they comprehend it and put it into practice. Finding our way to loving others like Jesus loves us is a difficult path. I don't think any one of us would disagree with that, but it's especially difficult for those who've been called by God to travel a very difficult and a very painful road. That was certainly true of this wonderful missionary by the name of Eleanor Chestnut. She was born in Waterloo, Iowa in 1868, but her father left the family at the time that she was born. And when she was only three years of age, her mother would also die, leaving her as an orphan. She was taken in uh, by neighbors, but she grew up knowing that she was, quote, a charity case, close quote. And as she grew, there also grew a gnawing resentment that she felt over her unfortunate and her unfair situation. Later, she would learn about a school called Park College and Academy. Uh, this was a school with a work-study program that would allow her to earn her way both through high school and also through college. As she entered school, friends would later describe her as odd, forlorn, unapproachable, proud, and eccentric. Not exactly words of praise and commendation. She arrived at this school when she was only 15 years old. She had no money. And because she was an orphan, she was forced to wear hand-me-down clothes donated for poor students. Uh, the testimony is she accepted them with much resentment. And her pride prevented her from feeling any gratitude for those who had provided them. In fact, those that ran the school described her as a problem student, outwardly brave and quiet, but inwardly troubled and unhappy. Looking back on her life at this particular time, Eleanor said, and I quote, nobody cares where I go or what I do. No one cares about me. It makes no difference about me. Well, she was wrong because God cared. Park College was a firmly committed Christian institution in the 19th century. Uh, students went to chapel three times a day. And I checked that out several times to make sure it wasn't three times a week. And no, it was three times a day. And they were also expected to attend church. And though we have no record of her conversion, 
There's little doubt that in her eighth year, she put her faith and trust in Christ and she joined the church there at Park. There's no debate because folks said immediately they began to see a change in her character and a change that true faith had indeed been embraced and that she began to move in a completely different direction with her life. And in fact, they said that the painful experiences of her childhood, instead of causing her bitterness, now caused her to have a great love and sympathy for others who were suffering. She would graduate from uh, Park in 1888 at the age of 20, and she would enroll in the Women's Medical College in Chicago. Her dream was to become a medical missionary. But her poverty continued to be a problem for her during her training. She lived in an unheated attic and cooked her own meals, mostly oatmeal, and she nearly starved her first year. She would work as a, summer, as a nurse during the summer to pay her expenses. And an interesting fact of history, she cared for a man named Oliver Wendell Holmes in his last days of illness. After medical school, Eleanor briefly attended Moody Bible Institute in preparation for the life of a missionary. In 1894, at the age of 26, she sailed to her first post in China. During her time in China, she would live out daily and sacrificially vital aspects of loving others as Jesus has loved us. And in fact, you see three aspects of that love here in John chapter 13. I'll just note them quickly. Number one, what does it mean to love others as Jesus has loved us? It means we serve others. In verses 1 through 11, you read the account of our Lord washing the feet of the disciples. And I might also add, very interestingly, it is apparent that he also washed the feet of Judas. Of course, this was the task of a Gentile servant or more often a Gentile slave. And I love the comment of Warren Wiersbe of the Moody Bible Church. Jesus was the sovereign, yet he took the place of a servant. He had all things in his hands, yet he picked up a towel. He was Lord and master, yet he served his followers. It has been said that humility is not thinking meanly of yourself. Humility is simply not thinking of yourself at all. And the Pauline commentary on this event is found beautifully in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 11, where he reminds us, yes, he did humble himself to be a servant, to be a slave, even to the point of a cross. And when you examine the life of Eleanor Chestnut, you find someone that followed beautifully in the steps of Jesus as she also served others. The last year of her life, which by the way was age 37, she treated 5,479 patients at the women's hospital in southern China. It is said that due to her work and the work of other missionaries, quote, converts multiplied until in the city of Ling Chao, there was a church with an adult membership of over 300. Again, what mindset led this little orphan girl to give her life as a medical missionary among a unreached people that she knew very little about? Well, in 1893, She'd applied to the Presbyterian Foreign Mission Board in New York, and she simply wrote, I am willing to be sent to whatever location may be deemed most fit. Uh, but she said, being asked if I had a preference, my, my thoughts turned to Siam. I, I do not, however, set my heart on any one place, but rather pray that whatever and wherever it may be, whatever or wherever may be the appointed place, that what powers I possess may be used to the best advantage there. And in a letter that we have preserved that she wrote to a friend just before she left for China, she said, I have had developed in me a liking for medical study, although I did not seriously think of the matter until late. It seemed to me such an utter impossibility to carry out this design as I am without means and without friends to assist, but... I do trust that I am by divine appointment fitted for this work. My age, 21 next January. Oh, how I long to do this work. Yes, she served others. But secondly, we should also work at being an example. Look at what you read back in chapter 13 in verses 12 through 15. When he, that is Jesus, had washed their feet, and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, 
He said to them, do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you also should do just as I have done. Eleanor Chestnut was stellar in the way she followed in her Lord's footsteps. In a simple article entitled, listen to this now, A Bathroom, A Leg, and a Dollar Fifty. Sounds like a Bruce Ashford title. <laughs> a bathroom, a leg, and a dollar fifty. John Clayton writes, and I quote, On August the 7th, 1893, Eleanor was appointed a medical missionary and assigned to South China. Her work there was complicated by a poor grasp of the language and by impoverished conditions. And she continually found herself in very difficult straits. She on one occasion told her supporters back home that a local doctor gave her the following prescription for healing ulcers. Here we go. You must catch some little rats whose eyes are not yet open. Pound them to a jelly. Add lime and peanut oil wanted to cure any kind of ulcers. Okay, I am all in favor of killing little rats, little mice. Not so sure about uh, applying that to take care of ulcers. On one occasion, she became responsible for a demented patient who had ruined his brain with the drug opium. She said he thinks he is continually being pursued by demons. I have no place for him but my study. He is sometimes violent and has to be carefully watched, so I'm sitting here on guard right now. But her affections for the people of Lynn Child was boundless. She used her own bathroom as an operating room. And once she took skin from her own leg as a graft for a coolie whose own leg was healing poorly following surgery. She would establish a women's hospital in Ling Chow, and she would live on a dollar fifty a month so that the rest of her salary could be used to buy bricks. Yes, she served others, and she was an incredible example. But thirdly, we must also never forget who we are. Look at verse 16 and verse 17. Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Jesus is simply reminding us that we are a servant of a great master and we are messengers of a great sovereign. And so we love as he loved and we serve as he serves and we're happy to do so. And we are confident and we are faithful and we trust where he sends us and we are confident and we trust to whom he sends us this is a very interesting point of history the same day that eleanor chestnut was martyred the presbyterian foreign mission board received a letter from her which she had written weeks earlier in it she wrote a poem concerning her own questions concerning divine guidance but here's what she wrote i love her honesty and i also love her faith being in doubt, I say, Lord, make it plain, which is the true, safe way, which would be in vain. I am not wise to know, not sure of foot to go. My blind eyes cannot see what is so clear to thee. Lord, make it clear to me. Being perplexed, I say, Lord, make it right. Night is as day to thee, darkness as light. I am afraid to touch things that involve so much. My trembling hand may shake. My skillless hand may break. But thine can make no mistake. And so even though she was uncertain of her future and basically lived faith uh, day by day in faith, she lived believing that our God can make no mistake. Like our Lord Jesus, she served in humility. She loved and she trusted the Father. My second observation, yes, we must love others as Jesus has loved us, but our love for others will show the nations. Our love for others will show the nations that we are Jesus' 
disciples. Look again at what it says in verse 35. By this, all people, don't miss that. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. C.S. Lewis said it well, and I think he's absolutely right. Now listen very carefully. It is probably impossible to love any human being too much. Let that sink in. It is probably impossible to love any human being too much. We may love him too much in proportion to our love for God, but it is not the smallness of our love for God, but it is the smallness of our love for God, not the greatness of our love for the man that constitutes the problem. Eleanor Chestnut loved her Savior, and because she loved him, she beautifully loved others, even those deemed unlovely by many. She immersed herself into the world of the needy, and she gave no regard to race, no regard to ethnicity, no regard to gender or any other social or cultural distinction. In fact, she said, and I quote, my life is lived so much among unlovely and unlovable people, I've learned to have great sympathy and great love for them. Now, there's something interesting about our love for others in that it shows the nations we are Jesus' disciples. First of all, I believe our love for others is to be missiological. The text says all people. The nations are in view here. All people will know by the way we live, by the way we love, by the way we serve, and even by the way we die that we belong to Jesus. They will know. And as a result of seeing him in us, they will be drawn as well. Eleanor Chestnut made this very famous missionary statement that you will find in many famous missionary quote books. I don't think we are in any danger. But if we are, we might as well die suddenly in God's work as by some long drawn out illness at home. Read that again. I don't think we're in any danger. And if we are, we might as well die suddenly in God's work as by some long, drawn-out illness at home. As John Pike would say, no wasted life here. In fact, one year she asked the board to send her as a physician to another hospital and to allow her to move away because there was an outlying city where no work was being done. And she went on to say very boldly and bravely, I am not afraid to live alone. In fact, during one of her furloughs, she heard another missionary, Dr. Finn of Peking, in an address on China, and he said if he had many lives, he would gladly, gladly give them all for that country. Eleanor turned to one of her friends and said, I honestly believe that I could say the same thing. Yes, our love for Jesus is a missiological love, but secondly, our love for others is also an irrefutable evidence that we belong to him. You see, we are known that we belong to Jesus by the way we love others. Now, let's just be clear here for a moment. To love others in this kind of a way is dangerous. To love others in this kind of a way runs a risk. But I think it's worth it. C.S. Lewis said it perfectly. To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly be broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must give your heart to no one, not even to an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in that casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken it will become unbreakable, impenetrable, irredeemable. Eleanor Chestnut loved like Jesus. In an article entitled Christ-like Love, Dr. Eleanor Chestnut in the Freedom Jordan Mission, it is said, and I quote, Dr. Eleanor Chestnut was a medical missionary to China, and her heart was almost nearly implanted in those she served. Dr. Chestnut beautifully exemplified Christ-like love. A beggar came to the hospital badly burned. 
but there was no skin to use for a graft. The next morning, the nurses learned that the operation had been performed. And when they noticed that Dr. Chestnut was limping, they realized that she had surgically cut and removed a large patch of her own skin to save the victim's life. They were shocked at such a sacrifice, for they could not understand why she would do that for a total stranger. Later, during the Box Rebellion, when thousands of Christian missionaries and Chinese Christians were massacred, this servant missionary showed a selflessness that profoundly impressed the Chinese people. As she was being led to prison, she saw a little boy bruised and bleeding. She broke away from her captors and knelt down to bind up the child's wounds. A few hours later, they murdered her for her faith. More than 50 years later, people in China still talked about the foreign doctor whose loving care for others made them think of her Jesus. I close. On October the 29th, 1905, at the height of anti-foreign sentiment in China, three new missionaries arrived at the Lin Chao Hospital, a single woman and a married couple with their 11-year-old daughter. Less than 48 hours later, a Chinese mob attacked the hospital. The little girl was the first to die, stabbed to death and thrown into the river. Her parents and the single woman were also clubbed to death. Eleanor Chestnut might have safely escaped, but she returned to the area of danger to help her fellow missionaries. Four men from the mob threw Dr. Chestnut into the river. Then one of them speared her with a pitchfork once in the neck, once in the breast and once in the lower part of her abdomen. The other men jumped in the water, held Dr. Chestnut under until she drowned. She was 37 years old. One account of her martyrdom notes, the last act of Dr. Chestnut, one of characteristic thoughtfulness and unselfishness was to tear off a portion of her skirt and bind up an ugly gash on the head of a Chinese boy who had been accidentally struck by a stone. Her last words were a plea for Mr. and Mrs. Peel. She told the mob to kill her if they desired to do so, but to spare the new missionaries who had just arrived and who could not possibly have offended them. But her words went unheeded. The death of Eleanor and the other missionaries was reported actually in the New York Times on November the 2nd, 1905. And Reverend Arthur J. Brown summarized their deaths. All these beloved missionaries had unreservedly consecrated themselves to the service of Christ. They were ready to go at any time that the master called. They were faithful unto death, and they have received the martyr's crown. Back home, the story of the courage of the missionaries called others to wish to follow in their footsteps. The church decided to redouble their missionary efforts in Lin Chao. Several men stepped forward to take over the work. Funds were raised for the mission as a memorial to the martyrs. And in 1907, Eleanor Carper, or Elizabeth Carper, excuse me, arrived to the administration of the, ho- of the ho- women's hospital, taking Dr. Chestnut's place. In 1915, 300 believers would worship at the Lin Chao Church. The work went on. And as one man said, we still remember the courage God gave to the little orphan girl from Waterloo, Iowa. On the wall of the Presbyterian Foreign Mission Board in New York is a bronze memorial tablet that simply says this, in loving memory of the missionary martyrs of Lin Chao, China, Eleanor Chestnut, M.D., Miss Ella Wood Mockley, her little daughter, Amy, Reverend John Rogers Peel and Miss Rebecca Gillespie Peel, who for Christ's sake suffered cruel death at Lin Chao, China, October the 28th, 1905. They loved not their lives unto death. John Piper sums up perfectly what this text that we have read is all about. And I close in quote, this is what Jesus is calling for among us. Go low in foot washing like service to one another. Lay down your lives, your privileges for one another. Love your brothers and sisters across all racial and ethnic lines. Love the weakest and the oldest and the youngest. Love the disabled. Love the lonely troublemaker. How blessed the church 
that loves like this. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for these words in the upper room that the Lord Jesus voiced on the very night that he knew that he would be betrayed and following that crucified. And I thank you that there is something missiological about the way we love and serve one another. Lord, may we indeed follow the example of our King and our Savior, our Master, but may we also draw strength from persons like Eleanor Chestnut and the other missionary martyrs that we too can say we will go wherever he wants us to go. We will do whatever he wants us to do. We will serve others like Jesus has served us, thanking our great God that by this the nations will know that we are his disciples. We ask and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.